Greetings. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. A couple of days ago, back on Wednesday, June 12th, I appeared on Berean TV for about 20 minutes, really 21 minutes, and I participated in a bit of an impromptu and freewheeling discussion. And afterwards, a couple of different people told me they enjoyed the discussion, so I thought I'd reshare it on my own channel. Now, as I was speaking off the cuff without any sort of prior preparation, I just jumped on while I was at work, I... At different points, I was paraphrasing different things from memory, and therefore, some of my paraphrasing might have been a tad imprecise. Therefore, in certain instances of this replay of the clip, when I'm referring to, for example, Martin Luther or Ulrich Zwingli or specific, especially the Talmud, I'll put graphics on the screen which clarify things a little bit. And with regard to specifically the Talmud, there's a portion in which I discuss an apparent or perceived Talmudic reference to the curse of Ham. But as I was working from memory, I misquoted the text and the relevant commentary in a few different ways. Uh, the broad strokes of what I was trying to say were correct, namely that the curse of Ham is arguably alluded to in the Talmud, but it's far from clear what the relevant Talmudic text actually means. But in what I actually say in the clip with regard to the finer details, again, while speaking off of the cuff, I fumbled whether the Talmudic text, for example, refers to Ham or Canaan or Ham's descendants, and I fumbled what precisely was said in a specific commentary, namely the commentary of Rashi, Rashi's commentary on that Talmudic text. So to quickly give a more accurate representation of the fact of the matter here, I'll sum it up this way. The Talmud says that Ham was struck by God in his skin. Now, many interpret that as intending to say that dark skin is a curse. However, the relevant Talmudic text does not say that explicitly. It does not say in what sense Ham's skin was struck, nor does it explicitly say such was upon Ham's descendants, though admittedly, perhaps one can infer an inclusion of Ham's descendants from accompanying references to certain animals, which is also found in that passage. But whatever the case, it's Rashi's medieval commentary on that Talmudic text that leads people closer to this idea that the text is referring to the curse of Ham. Rashi vaguely says that Ham's skin being struck refers to Cush coming out of Ham. And like I said, that brings us a bit closer to the idea that the text is referring to the curse of Ham. But as Rashi himself is vague on what Cush can mean, like for example, in his commentary on Numbers 12.1 and the semantic range of the related adjective Kushi or Kushit in the feminine, uh, you know, as he's vague on the topic of the semantic range of Kush, even Rashi's commentary leaves some questions open. And, and maybe I'll discuss uh, his commentary on Numbers 12.1 in, in another video. But suffice to say, even Rashi is vague here. But if Rashi intended a curse of ham style reasoning, that does not prove that the intention of the Talmudic text actually reflected Rashi's interpretation of that text. And I just wanted to put up that clarification as, like I said, when the clip gets to the portion on the Talmudic reference on Ham, I fumble some of the precise details a bit. But I'd, again, I'd say that the broader point still holds, and that is regarding the need to be careful about how clear or unclear the relevant Talmudic passage is. But with that, the rest of this video will just be a clip of my appearance on Berean TV from last Wednesday, again, June 12th. Uh, the discussion jumps around from topic to topic, so at certain points I'll have uh, some text at the bottom left of the screen uh, in which I offer some minor clarifications or maybe even the introduction of a new section. Uh, I'll also include the live chat on the right because I thought some of the comments were interesting and perhaps worthy of further discussion. Oh, and uh, one final note on the starting context. Uh, so this clip clip opens with a discussion on a video from the African Exodus channel titled The Universal Church Deception, and I'll link to that in the description. And uh, the image that's going to be on the screen for much of this clip is actually from that video. But with that, here's the clip. Again, it's going to run for about 21 minutes. Enjoy, share your thoughts, and God bless. Go ahead, Abu. I'm muting myself. I'm going to get some more cookies. Enjoy, enjoy the cookies. Enjoy the cookies. Uh, this woman, you notice her sort of like ecclesiology basically jumps from, you know, we just start from the Bible in a vacuum, and then it jumps over all of Christian history. Even anti-Nicene writers are irrelevant, jumps all the way to her. Or she would say, well, not just me, you as well. It's sort of like her, her, her methodology that she's recommending to others is basically lean on your own understanding, and that's it. Listen, you know? most excellent. Listen to what he's saying, most excellent. Go ahead. Oh, oh I, I know most excellent agrees with me. I'm sure he would be... Uh, 
<laughs> he was already thinking all of this as well, that, you know, she just sort of starts with the Bible. The Bible just appears out of thin air. And then you leap from the Bible to her in the 21st century. And so she just recommends, you know, just everybody just lean on their own understanding. And it's I mean, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be so sarcastic, but it at best, it's naive what she's saying at best. At worst, it's just really profoundly wrong on multiple levels. You know, and why is it the problem is why is it why is it a problem that especially the anti nazian church fathers that's Latin, y'all doesn't mean it before before the Council of Nicaea, those church fathers. There's a way we can trace doctrine, we can trace problems that came up, and we can see who stayed close to the teachings of the of the apostles and who strayed away. And when problems came up, if the problems got big enough, we had councils. The mere fact they're talking the way they're talking about councils, they don't, uh, it, it seems to me they don't have a, 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 a working knowledge of the history of the early church, the first 400 years specifically. What say you, Abu? No, yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, that, that that sums it up. And But I think she might say that, because she was talking about how she uh, reserves the right to, to disagree with Ignatius, and that's fine. But the idea basically is, well, how would you know that all of the, even, you know, the anti-Nasin anti uh, church fathers, even all of them were wrong? How would we know? Well, because they contradict her, uh, you know, her private interpretation of the Who's scriptures. Who's the authority? Come on. Come on. Yeah. What other key, read some of the you look, you can look in the comment section. They make it. Yeah, I can comments. see them. Is there something specific you want me to, to no anything that you see you call out? I didn't even get get my cookies yet. I'll be ready to catch you. Well, actually, I wanted to address Kobe's question. Kobe says, uh, didn't Protestants kind of do the same thing? What I would say is that there's you know the low church and the high church. I think some of the earliest Protestants, you know, the reformers, like for example, primarily Martin Luther. And, and the people who try to hold to where Luther was at, they would try to say that their conception of sola scriptura is not just this wholesale rejection of everything between the Bible and oneself, right? And so that's sort of a thing that that comes up. I mean, I want to attribute it to modernity, but it does come up, you know, shortly after the start of the Reformation with more radical groups. But how could I put this? She sort of represents a a, a radical approach that was not taken by all the reformers so of course certain parts of the protestant reformation obviously held closer to uh christian history i mean even king james he has his writing in the basilicon doron he talks about at least affirming the first four ecumenical councils and i'm sure you know martin luther to some extent uh held an allegiance to the councils and stuff like that so i don't think being a Protestant necessarily means agreeing with her, but she is a representative of this very modern sort of low church idea, for the most part modern, but the seeds of it were planted earlier where, you know, as the stereotype says, just me and my, uh, just me and my Bible, you know? I think some today use the, and even some uh, high church Protestants use the phrase uh, solo scriptura with the O <laughs> to, to, to sort of uh, depict this, you know, just me and my Bible approach. What do you what do you think about? I think that's came that came up with the solas scriptura and and that being a problem within Protestantism. Of well, course, I, we'll say that y'all with the tradition, y'all gonna put y'all to your tradition on level with scripture. Pope can interpret mm -hmm. scripture. We'll argue that, but are Protestants hypocritical and trying to act like everything come from the scripture alone? And, and we cause problems with that. Did the reformers cause some problems that later on? within the Protestant church that we see now that could have been avoided? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I do think, I, I am wary of, like, while, of course, as, as I just said, I don't think sola scriptura necessarily entails what she's doing, I do think the idea of the individual saying, you know, here I stand, I can do no better, you know, unless you can convince me, it sort of invites us into a situation where we constantly have to reinvent the wheel with every single individual and they just go their own way if it doesn't make sense to them. I, I think, I understand if people want to say, well, I'm not ready to jump in with just Rome or I'm not willing to just jump in with, let's say, you know, Constantinople with mainstream Greek Orthodoxy or something like that. But I think if someone is taking a position that's at odds with basically the entirety of the spectrum of ancient churches from not only the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church to the mainstream Chalcedonian Orthodox churches, but even, you know, the so-called Oriental Orthodox or Miaphysite churches like the Ethiopians and the Syrian Orthodox and the Armenians, like if, if there's a position that all of them agree on and someone saying, well, you know, me and my Bible have come to a different conclusion. 
I find that as a cause for concern. And I, I, I do think we should be wary of disagreeing with things that all the churches agree on. And mainstream stuff, mainstream yeah. stuff. Yeah. But you see that once you get into the situation where it's just me and my Bible, there's literally Anything goes. exactly there's literally nothing that's not up for grabs. I mean, even the virgin birth, people will tell you, oh, that's not biblical. You know, mm. anything, anything is 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 open to uh, dispute, as you've seen on this channel. I mean, you know, salvation for the Gentiles, salvation for all mankind. Crazy, I mean, yeah, crazy. everything is up for grabs because someone's saying, basically, I looked in the Bible. I don't see that. I see the opposite. And it's it's anarchy, to be honest. It, yeah, it I, I can't. All right, Matt. Oh man, Matt, loving that right there. Rev, see you on the organ. Do me a favor. I don't know how much time you got, but Lashawn J on we get this sister and says, Seminary Cove is right under Rev C. Says the reason she sounds like that is because look at what is happening with the church. We know we have been lied to about a lot of things, believe it or not. So who can we trust? Where is our Moses? It really would depend on what we mean. I think people get led into believing they were lied to about something, but it it really depends on what we're referring to. And sometimes give him a few. Don't let him talk. Don't let him talk. That Jesuit talk. Give him a few examples. Yeah, an what? example. I mean, you I do think to this the idea story. that the entire church lied to us. Uh, okay. It leads to uh, often those polemics are, are simplistic and what they're they're set up to do is they're set up to manipulate people into jumping from the frying pan into the fire, as it were. One thing that I've seen with a lot of cult groups is they'll ask a question to a, a lay person and that lay person can't think of anyone around them who can answer that question, not their priest, not their pastor or whatever, and not other people in their congregation. And then the person who hit them with that question that seems new to them will say, you know, look, mm -hmm. the church isn't teaching you this truth. You should join mm -hmm. me. But then mm -hmm. what happens is off, more often than not, in a lot of these cult groups, that quickly transitions into now you have to accept me as an authority, as a prophet. And that's where all the financial exploitation comes in. And sometimes, you the know, same, a lot of these things that they come on, come yeah, on, they replace the church. It becomes the new magisterium that, that happens with a lot the of groups. same exact thing so let me see let's let's give her a second because they like 18 seconds behind us let's see if she have examples that'll help us LaShawn. you see we want to reason we want to reason together let's give some examples of what we've been lied to of course they're going to get back to putin they may get with the pictures and why do y'all have the pictures in the catholic church y'all have been hiding them and and now the truth is coming out. So now you 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 wanna you wanna um get out here and, and, and do some cleanup um for the wicked church because the truth is coming out that they found out on their own apocrypha and Enoch and things y'all been hiding. He said a booze talking good. Let me see if she come back um, <laughs> yeah, so just to be clear, LaShawn. Oh, it's, he says Kobe writes, uh, we were told that even a radical position of messianic ideology is still messianic ideology. By that logic, her radical Protestant ideology should still represent foundational Protestant theology. This is an interesting point. This is something that I want to say. Uh, sometimes um, certain Israelite polemicists, not all, but some Israelite polemicists will say that, you know, all the Protestant churches are basically just the daughters of Rome. Right. So yeah, I mean, like, for example, GMS used to say that if you are Baptist, you're still a Catholic. If yes, you're, yes. you know, if you're Jehovah's Jewish, Witness, yes, you're yes, still a Catholic. Yes. You know, basically, if you have anything in common with the, the Catholic Church and it's something I don't like, then you're a Catholic. But I think that the flaw with that is that if we're going to be so open ended that, you know, Baptists can be considered Catholics and Jehovah's Witnesses can be considered mainstream Christians and even Catholics. If it's if it's so open ended, why would one West Israelite groups and other New Testament affirming Israelite groups not be part of that cacophony? There's no reason to exclude them. If you can include Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons within the, 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 the Christian spectrum, there's no reason to exclude one West. So they're just part of that cacophony and they come out of it. I mean, to give an easy example of that. Uh, Ma Shah, he was one of the seven heads at the original school at One West. Yes, yes, one he, one, yes. he, they used to have on the website that he studied at a Baptist seminary, you know? So, oh, I mean, yeah? Like, the, yeah, these guys themselves, uh, or Wentworth Matthew, who started the Commandment Keepers, he yes, used to yes. call himself Bishop Wentworth Matthew. He was part of a, a originally a Christian organization oh, that slowly mm -hmm. peeled away all of the, its Christian symbols, but it was even called something like the, you know, the uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, Pillar and Ground of Truth. It was called that for a while, his group, you know? So, I mean, even these Israelite groups are outgrowths of of, of previous forms of Christianity. Yes. So there's no reason yes. to exclude them from that that spectrum, you know. You see, um, this was I don't know if he answered it. Oh, earlier. actually, no. We, we were trying to answer that in the in the um, in the comment section. I'm glad that came up. Where does the curse of Ham come from? So the curse of Ham doctrine, as far as like associating it with dark skin, right? This polemic 
it's not clear exactly where the origins are, but it does seem like there's a there's an argument to be said that the Talmud seems to allude to it. The Talmud talks about different people who have been struck, and it says that you know uh, that that Ham. Uh, was cursed or, or Ham's descendants were cursed. Some of Ham's descendants were cursed with, uh, with a striking of their skin. But what's so that the, the immediate sense is, ah, that seems to be a very early reference to. Did you see one earlier? Well, I don't know about early. What some people have carefully noted is that when you look at where the Talmud says that, and I'm not talking about like in an English translation, I'm talking about like an actual page of Talmud where you get the commentaries on the side. It's yeah. Rashi's commentary, which is medieval. Rashi's like in the 10th or 11th century that says when it says struck the skin, it means make it, I, I forget the exact wording, but basically he says black skin, right? And then that rate, what some more nuanced uh, types have, have pointed out is why would Rashi need to clarify that? He needed to clarify it because the Talmud is actually vague in what sense uh, Ham's skin or Canaan's skin was struck. That's where the vagueness comes in. As, as one commentator pointed out, I'm talking about a modern commentator, said for all we know, it could have been struck with leprosy. You know, like it, it doesn't actually say dark skin, you know. But I mean, it's who knows. It, it, but it does. It, it, it seems at least like the like the Talmud is uh arguably alluding to the curse of ham doctrine vis-a-vis -vis skin color and so storm ready says abu what does the catholic church have in common with the protestant church the answer is it depends on which protestant church we mean the protestant spectrum is very diverse and so different very. parts of that spectrum have more or you less in common with the catholic church on. high church anglicans you know some of them are affirming the uh the uh, much of the 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 Mariology, you know, the the perpetual virginity. Some high church Anglicans even favor the Immaculate Conception. Uh, then, of course, you get away with that. But then you, uh, mo with most Protestants, don't favor that today. But you know, some Protestants believe in the real presence to various degrees. Of course, uh, we some would insist on a definition of Protestant, which makes Trinitarian uh, yeah, essential sorry. to it. Not everybody yeah. insists on that, but a lot of people yeah. would insist that Protestant means Trinitarian, so obviously they have that in common. So really, but it depends on what part of the Protestant spectrum we're referring to. Well, one thing on the real presence, one of my favorite lines, forgive me for the segue, but um, what's his name? Martin Luther was very hostile to people who denied that the bread and wine of the Euc of the Eucharist uh, were literally the flesh and blood. Yes. He used to call the people who denied that enthusiasts. Uh, what, do you, he, what do y'all call the word to start with a T? What do y'all call the word? Transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. Where the substance somebody put that in the, the Rev. C. Somebody spell, know how to spell that. Put that in the comments. I'll put it in. I'll put it right in. Yeah, Thank you. And um, that was one. And the last thing is, do but Martin you... Luther affirmed it. And he, the funny thing is, he said, "Now keep in mind, Martin Luther hated the Pope, but he hated the enthusiasts, as he called them, the enthusiasts, the, the deniers the of that even more." That? So Martin Luther famously said, "I'd rather drink blood with the Pope than drink mere wine with the enthusiasts." You see that? That's serious stuff. Um, <laughs> some people feel Martin Luther never really planned to start no Protestant movement. That was never the intent from the gate. It, you know, coming out the gate, that was never the intent, but things just happened and it just went for He just wanted to change some things. Well, yeah, and, 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 he saw and that it, other it people going turn into this. Well, he and he and in his own lifetime, he felt people were taking it too far. He felt that Zwingli took it too far. And ironically, Zwingli felt the same way about other people. Zwingli famously said that if every blockhead tries to build a congregation around his private doctrines, the church will be splintered, you know, all to, over to the like we yeah. have today in Protestantism. By the way, I see LaShawn uh, left another comment. She says, just stop. We've been lied to about a lot. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. He says, uh, let's just start with one. Who we are and why we never knew the very people we prayed for every Sunday didn't even respect that very... Uh, so I guess LaShawn is talking about uh, Israelite heritage or something like that. I don't know if you see that comment. Yeah, that one. So here's what I would say about that. I think this is an example of, first off, an oversimplification uh, with regards to... We never knew that the very people we prayed for every Sunday didn't even respect the very man black people revered, that being Jay. I assume she means Jesus. Here's the thing. Not all churches teach this uh, dispensationalism where the, you know, where the mainstream Jews are, you know, the, the, the Israel of the Bible. Uh, historical Catholicism and ha has rejected that. And or most of uh, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy rejects that to this day. You know, that's very much an American Protestant ideal. That's not all of Christianity. That's a modern American Protestant ideal, this idea that the mainstream Jews are the Israel of God. But uh, with regards to who, as she put it, who we are, that's honestly, this is where I, I, I struggle to put this politely, but I think this is 
something that is more of an emotionally charged uh, issue. Like, very, and it's very popular. We can't get away from it. We can't run. Right. This is a big. This is a big charge against the entire church. And it, it would immediately beg the question of how she's defining we. So, for example, and how she, you know how we say who a population is or isn't, or how we say who a person is or isn't. The reality is that within the Israelite spectrum, they don't even agree on the definition of Israelite. There's all these different definitions of Israelites. You, you have some who are insisting on a patrilineal definition where the only thing that matters is your paternal line. Then you have others who are saying, no, it could be paternal and maternal. Uh, then you have other people who are insisting on this three uh, three generation model where you know you could have people who don't descend from Jacob on either their mother or their father's side, but they're still Israelites because of you know marrying in through generations and all this kind of thing. Uh, and so it's very open-ended and every faction is claiming that you know their interpretation, their definition of Israelite comes from the Bible and so forth. But what I would say is that before we can even say who an individual or a population is, we first have to have our definition set, how we're defining that population, and then how we define what quote unquote nation a, a, an individual comes from. So for example, if if LaShawn, for example, is thinking about a morphologically defined group, a group that's defined by outward appearance, like quote unquote uh, white people or quote unquote black people. Yes. Yeah, the reality is, is that if we're defining them patrilineally, these morphological spectra, quote unquote white, quote unquote black, are actually even in America are diverse. They come from a lot of different paternal lines. They're not one people. So it, it makes sense that the the church had no business saying who this morphologically defined group is, you know. It's ridiculous to look at a population like that, like let's say African Americans, and say, oh, they're Hamites, or oh, they're Israelites, or oh, they're this other thing. They're the reality is, is that when we're talking about lineages. Common sense would say they're likely diverse, and now the genetic evidence makes clear that they're quite diverse. Look at this. This is a this is a problem too. We hear a lot of people talking about the Ebionites, and y'all stomped them out, and y'all hiding the truth of the Nazarites and the Nazarene. And read some of that. And, and, and what are your thoughts on this right here? We never knew the doctrine of the Nazarites. All were Nazarites except Paul. I mean, okay, if you say, I, look, I, <laughs> we're Where's sort of from you. You've you've seen this before, and y'all. I, I mean, what there? exactly the person means? I can my I, I would have to know what exactly he means, but I, I assume he means that like maybe uh, the other apostles were holding to the law, and Paul was teaching some sort of lawlessness. I think things really start to break down when. Uh, you know, when we start denying parts of the scriptures and stuff, because then we're not really, we're not even going to the scriptures. Now it really is man's own understanding because he's not even getting it from his understanding of the scriptures. He now becomes the judge over the scriptures and can kick out, you know, epistles mm. and stuff like that. As for what you just put on the screen from LaShawn, she says, uh, no one tells the truth anymore. You sit in here beating around the bush. So we have to lean on our own understanding almost. Um, I think she, so I saw she had an earlier comment about, she said, uh, try not to miss because she said, so just above that, just a little bit before that, she said, Black this people one? in America, let's not beat around the bush. It's it was above it, yes, okay, so exactly. So, and then and then she went on to the comment, she said, I'm beating around the bush, I'm not beating around the bush, and then she goes on to say, Look, I don't care about none of that, all I'm saying is we have been lied to. But here's the thing I think this is what I'm talking about, about how this is an emotionally charged issue. What I was tackling is that this idea of who are quote unquote black people, right? That's an overly simplistic question and it requires nuance. It requires clarification on, on definitions. But you notice how once I start to just scratch the surface of that needed nuance, the emotion sets in and people get, yeah. set, get upset and say, well, I'm not interested in that. Forget it. You're lying. People have lied to me. It's yeah. I, I think that's a conversation that really needs to be slowed down and talk about, you know, what we mean by these different terms, like what we mean by Israelite, what we mean by these morphological categories and so on down the line. You know, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I don't care about parsing or tenses. Yeah, exactly. No, and and because they're automatically assuming we are all the same people. Y'all didn't do that, and 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 this is what it is. Now we found out the truth. Y'all can't even talk to us, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, that's uh, unfortunately that's what happens in a lot of these situations. You know, it's. Well, oh, I also say this: one of the stereotypes that Israelites have, not all Israelites, nothing is universal to all Israelites, but a lot of Israelite polemicists on the internet, they present this idea of like your pastor or your church won't let you ask the tough questions. They don't let yeah. you ask the tough questions, and that's why you should come over to this other group or this spectrum of groups or spectrum of individuals. But you notice that when you go over there, suddenly 
a, a lot of them, not all obviously, but a lot of them are also hostile to free speech, to questioning, very, to, you know, exactly. Don't question my pastor. I mean, game. Come on. Yeah. I just recently received a comment. Somebody was uh, talking about uh, how dare this other person question Benaya, you know? You know, the, are you supposed to give double honor to the, you know, to the leaders who rule well and all this and stuff like wow. that? Like somehow he should be exempt from criticism, you know? That's that's yeah. only going to get me the same thing that they think or they claim with the church. They'll 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 do their leaders or their leaders will behave in the same way, but they just can't see it. All right, anything else before we get out of here? I'll no, play I'm, the rest I'm of happy this to thing. jump off. I'll let you uh, get back okay. to it. All right, man. Thank Appreciate you for having me on. God All right. bless. All right. Still ain't asking about that check. I've seen that place, Alton got, but we'll leave it alone. His work.